Hello, and welcome to another OpenShift Commons uh, community meeting. Um, I'm Karina Angel, and today we have Jared and Aaron from SASTEL. We invited them because they had a great presentation at our OpenShift Commons gathering in um, Boston at Red Hat Summit. And we had a lot of community members asking questions. And instead of pinging them directly, we asked them to come join us and go through a run through. And if you have questions that you want to ask now, please uh, start putting them into the chat or into the notes document and we can get those answered. And uh, just a few quick announcements. I will put them into the notes as well is we do have um, the Raleigh Commons gathering coming up on October 18th. And then we have the one for KubeCon on November 6th. Um, so if you haven't registered, please register and reach out for, with any questions. Um, and right now, Jared, Aaron, wondering if you could give a quick intro um, to your roles and, um, and then maybe we'll just dive right in. Uh, yeah, I'm Aaron Charche. Um, work at SaaSL, Telco Cloud Development. Um, been doing software development for the better part of 15 years now, and then moved to the cloud stuff when Kubernetes first, well, before GA. So I started doing that around that point, and now I'm just solely focused on essentially GitOps and our deployment automation. Uh, yep, yeah, uh, Jared DeBolt, also with the work at SaaSTEL on the same team as Aaron. Um, bit of different backgrounds that we came from. So mine is primarily more focused on the the network side of the house. So uh, been at SaskTel for 20 plus years, uh, primarily working in the wireless space. So specifically 3G PP wireless, which is uh, the difference there is that it's not uh, like the Wi-Fi, but it's specifically the cellular data that you have on your smartphone. And so a lot of the network uh, background in there, all the, the network elements that uh, uh, are getting transitioned from the old big metal to virtual and uh, container network functions is sort of where I'm coming in. So Aaron and I kind of uh, work together, uh, bringing both our skill sets into what we're, I guess, about to present today here. Uh, so hopefully that's a good intro. Perfect. Thank you. And I can start whenever you'd like, or you, if you wanted anything else to, uh, before we continue on the slide here. Oh, please go for it. Um, yeah. I love your title. Cool. Yeah, so like I think we kind of covered a bit of this here, but I, I just wanted to kind of like make a note about this in general and that um, one of the things that's kind of interesting that I've noticed is that a lot of practitioners uh, in cloud, um, we, we tend to have these like siloed teams where there's like the like the IT group that maybe looks after server and cloud and, and storage and stuff. You have another team that's like dev, you have regular software development, you have another network team that you have to put all your requests through. Um, something that's been super effective for us is the fact that our team is made up of individuals that have a lot of these uh, competencies from other roles uh, being working together side by side is we kind of overcome a lot of those roadblocks right out of the gate. So, you know, when we want to do something, on our say RIP fabric, so that's kind of my domain of, of expertise. Um, when we look at a problem with cloud and with OpenShift, um, oftentimes what I find online is blogs around um, how to solve it, maybe the traditional uh, Linuxy way, uh, and you know from this standpoint of maybe a, a normal cloud practitioner. But when I come at it, I'm sort of looking at it from a, a, a service provider, network person, and so then oftentimes our solutions end up being a little bit more. Uh, telco specific as a result of that. But I find that the ability to bring like a network person that's sort of like a network guy that's moving into dev and then a dev person that's moving into network, the strengths of, of both of our areas kind of when they coincide, make a really uh, effective a team at, at actually coming up with a solution. And so I think definitely breaking down that silo thing has been super effective for us to, to get to the stages that uh, we're gonna present here today. So, uh, so anyways, we kind of covered that off here. So really, where uh, this presentation came from is in the telco space. Uh, telco cloud is really just regular cloud, but the difference is, is that it is very focused on the functions that we need in our network to enable our services. So a service provider, you know, that might be something like uh, what we would call like a, a packet gateway. So a packet gateway might be a function that in a service provider network is responsible for handing out an IP address to your cell phone. It's, you know, where all of your packets go in and out of that particular 
function. Uh, it would do things like enforcement to say, you know, when you guys maybe go over your cap on your data caps and you get speed reduced at say 20, 30, 50 gigs, a packet gateway function would be one of those enforcement devices. So we traditionally would have those big boxes and they're, you know, sometimes they'd half a rack full, sometimes an entire rack. Um, and so we've been trying to really move our cloud uh, and our sort of legacy functions into both virtual network functions with with uh, OpenStack and then the container network functions with OpenShift. So, and I'll kind of drive into that a bit here. Um, so I guess I may be getting ahead of myself here, but like one thing that's kind of unique about um, the telco cloud space is that we're doing the same things. We're just like virtualizing like software you know you're just packaging up you know docker containers or images and you're pushing to a registry and you're running them but it's really the protocols in question that we're dealing with so you know by and large most um most use cases you see in the enterprise are very http centric so it's always the same thing it's some sort of you know uh web tier in an app and a database in telco it's very much um very nascent protocols that we use um that perform these actions so you know for instance uh, sctp uh, is a signaling protocol or a transport mechanism we use to signal a lot of the things where, you know, just when you dial on your phone, you know, and you call another person, uh, the number of systems that interact to make that call go through um, is, you know, in the orders of like 20 to 30 different elements along the way. And each of those elements has these sort of open interfaces between them that communicate sort of like an API of sorts. But because those protocols are very specific to the tel telecommunication space, you don't often find very much uh, resource online to help kind of like explain how to like make these CNFs and these functions performant in those environments, right? So we need to be really low latency. We really need to make sure that we have super high availability. So, you know, something like just a container failing over, if it doesn't fail over and under, you know, 50 milliseconds, that's like a dropped call in our world. So those are really important factors that we have to consider here. So. Uh, that's what's sort of, I guess, maybe more unique about um, our use case with this, with respect to cloud. Uh, so, just to sort of illustrate, uh, you know, what, what I'm talking about here, like this device that you're seeing here, is in Nokia DX200 platform for voice switching. So, uh, traditional 3G voice calls would go through a, a basically a piece of equipment like this. Lots of different line cards um, are outfitted in each of these slots. Each of them perform completely different functions. It's completely proprietary. There is no um, x86 common hardware at play here. So this is basically um, you know, where we were coming from. And we had this big promise that we were offered by you know, all the vendors in this space about, you know, let's move to cloud, let's move to 5G uh, with service-based architectures. We're going to solve all these problems of this old uh, big gray box hardware. And we're going to commoditize it, right? We're going we're gonna to have all these racks of servers they're all going to be just your standard COTS hardware that we buy from whoever your favorite uh, compute vendor is. And what we would do is we'd have like this generic compute in our data center. Um, we wire it up just like all the public cloud folks, and we would just run these different workloads. You know, if we need a vendor A happens to provide a packet gateway function, like I mentioned earlier, we might run their workloads there. We may have another vendor that does something like a BRAS for so or a GPON service. So maybe you've got fiber to your house or something like that that they would live maybe on the same set of servers in the same OpenShift cluster, because that's really a key piece here is that is the multi-tenancy that we were promised. And so this is what we were kind of anticipating when we started to go down this path. Um, and then ultimately this is where we we sort of were, we landed in terms of what vendors were offering us here. So essentially every vendor that came to the table here would say, okay, we're gonna sell you a function. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna ship you a rack and it's gonna have our servers in it. And we're gonna put our managed OpenShift uh, on that set of clustered servers. And it's gonna have its own set of uh, IPs that are completely um, constrained just to that particular rack. And all the workloads that are on here are gonna be exclusive to our use case. So if we say, well, you might be my PGW vendor, I'd like to also run maybe a AAA vendor on the same cluster. They'd say, nope, can't do that, it's not supported. You have to just use our own. And so the problem here is that as you can kind of see like the gray box approach, which was what we had, this is just sort of a new reimagining of that, right? The vendors are still trying to push the same purpose built um, rack of servers to do a particular function. And so this is where we uh, we were kind of realized that the, there's a bit of a lie here. And that's where that maybe the, the uh, overcoming fake cloud and telco came as a title here is because we found out quickly that uh, what vendors are calling cloud is, is far from that. 
Uh, so here's you know a few things that we started to start to understand when our first vendor came in uh, trying to deploy an OpenShift cluster for their functions. Um, you know, manual OpenShift installation. So you know, being you know that we live in this world of, of public cloud, we expect to log into a console. We expect to say you know instantiate a new instance in AWS or GCP or whichever, and you've got a cluster of OpenShift uh, worker nodes in a control plane. Well, that didn't exist. I mean, these folks were showing up with some servers, they would mount a ISO image and they would just like the traditional way or in some cases even USB sticks and start to try to build an OpenShift installation. Uh, single VNF, uh, so the vendor would say, nope, we're not gonna run any other workloads, just our own. That was a thing that we noticed right away. Um, security, like they just automatically assume that they're gonna have root access and cluster admin to an OpenShift cluster right out of the gate and that they have full uh, unfettered access to do what they like. Um, they would do strange things like, you know, we've got this, you know, fleet of workloads of worker nodes that are all the same hardware and they would fix their workloads to go on a single worker. So they'd say, you know, we're going to label this one particular worker node, we'll call it PGW node, and then they would make it so that it would only schedule to those nodes and we're like, well, we have all these other workers that can perform the same functions that sort of commoditized and just sort of abstracted away. Why aren't you doing that? And this was like foreign concept to them. Uh, version control, like we just, there was no version control and this is sort of where the GitOps piece comes in here. Um, you know, these would be packaged up and delivered to us uh, over email. We'd get a help chart with value files in a, like a, a TGZ, you know, attachment in an email. And that's the way that they would deliver a Helm chart for a particular CNF function. And then ultimately when they would go to install things, they would say, okay, well, we need access to your bastion host so that we can log into your OpenShift cluster, and we're going to use OC commands to interact with the cluster and deploy our, our CNFs here. And so, you know, very quickly out of the gate, we realized like all the cloud uh, we were promised, this is, just wasn't there. We didn't have multi tenant, there was no scale on scale out. We we're just hard coding workloads to single uh, compute nodes. Security was just not there. Automation, CI CD didn't exist. GitOps wasn't even a word that they were familiar with here. Um, so, just to kind of impress upon the the team here about like the extent of this. So when we joined the very first WebEx meeting for them to build out their OpenShift cluster, this is the approach that they took. And what we noticed is that they would, again, mount the ISO image of uh, OpenShift Live ISO, and they would be mounting it overseas. And this would be the menu that they would interrupt it by pressing the E key on their keyboard to edit the, um, the kernel arguments. And they would begin to manually type what is highlighted in purple here. Um, and so it would, you know, inevitably occur is it wouldn't work. And then we'd find out that, oh, you mistyped that subnet there. It's not 224, it's supposed to be 240. And so then they have to start the whole process over again. And we'd have to wait for the whole boot process to go through. And as you're watching this happen, and we, you know, Aaron and myself kind of came from a, a, a space within OpenStack and a lot of the other stuff we do on our IP fabric, we just thought, this is madness. Like, how could anybody conceivably think that this is an approach to deploy a, a cloud, especially for a telco? So um, this is where we said, okay, we're not gonna let this happen. We're, we're basically taking over the reins of the, of the container platform. Um, it was it was approach that we had to essentially convince the vendor that we're just gonna host your workloads and we're gonna run the cluster on your behalf. Uh, and so some of our kind of key tenants here of, of doing that was, you know, a lot of the things that there were deficiencies that we identified up front. Um, but just sort of a number of like really important pieces here is that we want this to be multi-tenant um, uh, out of the gate. You know, we're a telco that's, somebody used the word, we're, we're too big to be small and we're too small to be big. We're not in a position to buy uh, a cluster of 50 servers at a time for every vendor or even like a cluster of say a dozen servers for every vendor. We're trying to commoditize our cloud so that we have our investment and our capital expenditures is set in, in our budget cycles, and we need to be able to use that hardware to the best of our ability. So multi-tenancy was critical for us. Um, configuration of the actual rollout of both OpenShift and all the tenant workloads had to be GitOps. Um, uh, we wanted everything to be going through our GitLab uh, private internal uh, uh, repositories here so that no configuration was happening uh, manually through CLI commands. A lot of the same tenants that you know we've been arguing about with our network automation initiatives at SASTEL. Um, we're trying to get people off the keyboards and everything needs to be done through some sort of an actual uh, CI workflow. Um, we're workers, workers are workers are worker as far as we're concerned. If it's got 
so many CPU cores, so much memory, and it, maybe it has a specific uh, hardware capability, perhaps like a SRV, um, SRV uh, capable NICs that have to have high throughput, then we would label that node accordingly based off the hardware, but it will never be labeled based off of the vendor that's actually going to be running on that or the function in question. Um, and then I guess where things start to really come together here, uh, where we leveraged our existing uh, ecosystem of tools was we're very heavy uh, Netbox users at Thestel. Um, we use it exclusively to manage our entire IP fabric. So this is the you know top of rack switches, the the spine environments, our core routers. Um, all the configuration for that is driven from the Netbox data modeling. Um, we have Ansible that is you know rendering some configurations for those devices to do that. Terraform is helping us with a lot of our um, sort of IAC type of approach to spinning up this bare metal hardware, uh, GitLab and uh, Vault for our secrets management here. And so we wanted, um, you know, we wanted to sort of see like how far could we take this? Could we could basically deploy an OpenShift cluster with one click automation, including tenant workloads here? And then obviously the most important thing for us is that rolling out software in a CNF environment for a service provider, you know, we talk about like canary workloads and, you know, blue green, that kind of stuff. But like when we, deploy an application, we're not in a position to say, okay, we only want 10% of our HTTP requests to hit this one container uh, that's maybe on a new release. We're very much still kind of caught up in that legacy architecture a little bit where it's sort of all or nothing. We kind of have to make sure we test within dev, understand it's going to work. We have to move into QA and then subsequently production. And we still have some of those change windows here, right? Because when we make a mis if you make a mistake on a, a very critical function, like an MME, which is responsible for a lot of like the authentication connectivity when your phone first turns on with a SIM card, if that's down, you know, you, nothing works effectively. And so we make the news when we make a mistake. And so uh, for us, it was very important that whatever our workload was, it needed to be something that we could start off in dev and subsequently roll out to QA in production as a very sort of, you know, clear software development life cycle, but for network functions for telco. And I'm gonna hand it over to, Net or to Aaron here in a sec. I just wanna kind of touch on the um, the data modeling for Netbox here, but for those that you don't, uh, the you that don't know what Netbox is, um, it's sort of a funny kind of tie-in now with with Red Hat and the IBM uh, kind of relationship there. In that uh, Netbox Labs uh, was originally kind of under the umbrella of NS1, and now it's uh, part of the sort of IBM um, purview. Um, but this tool um, is open source. It's uh, got a really great community. And it's been critical for us to maintain our uh, data center infrastructure. So this is like racks, servers, cables, uh, IP addresses, VLANs, all that kind of good stuff. Um, but because we were using it so uh, heavily with our IP fabric, and we thought, well, wait a second here, like every worker node that we're gonna tie into our IP fabric is gonna have to have a VLAN on a port. It's gonna have to have an IP address on a bonded interface. Why wouldn't we just find a way to make Netbox be part of that sort of overall workflow? Because you can't have a, a server come online if the switch port doesn't have the VLAN on the same port. So we may as well tie these things together. So we essentially use Netbox to model um, our servers, our switches, the cables that connect between them, all the VLANs, IP addresses. We sort of define all of that uh, to the best of our ability within Netbox. And Netbox is one of these sort of 80-20 tools. And what I mean by that is that you're not gonna find a drop-down menu in Netbox that says, you know, OpenShift cluster name. It's it's not gonna be there, it's not a thing. So there's a lot of sort of abstractions that you have to imagine on how you're gonna tie this together. And rather than relying on like literal parameters that are inserting into an OpenShift cluster, you have to say, well, we're gonna use this and we're just gonna sort of massage the data to fulfill the requirement that we have here. And so in our case, that uh, Netbox has a REST and a GraphQL API. So we basically hit a query with our Terraform, uh, with the Terraform provider, it says, give me all this information about our OpenShift workloads from Netbox. And it has all of the attributes or the inputs that we need to, if you imagine like what a cluster installer would have for OpenShift, the YAML file, all the different key value pairs that are in there, effectively the values are coming from Netbox in this case, instead of being in a, in a flat file. Um, and so, yeah, basically what I just touched on here, just the stuff that we model here, it's um, all the network infrastructure, all the physical uh, server stuff. And, and I guess the, the other piece about this is, besides this just being like a, a an OpenShift um, solution here for us, this is also really helpful for, for 
people who are actually expanding horizontally scale in your network. So you probably everybody on the call has a, a SOC team or a, a team that's responsible for like racking and stacking servers. Well, the way that we normally have it handle this is we model things in NetBox for OpenShift cluster. And this is sort of our intent. So we describe our intent within NetBox. And then what ends up happening is we essentially produce an artifact from that, which is like a work order. That work order includes things like go put this server in this rack, in this U position, run the cable from this port to this other switch port. And because we have all of that communicated in one single source of truth, there's no sort of um, uh, extra step where somebody's you know converting something to an Excel or an email as a subsequent process. It's all sort of baked into our workflow. And the benefit of that as well is because we have the source of truth, we have the ability to um, we have the ability to leverage NetBox to sort of ensure that the infrastructure matches what our intent was. And so uh, we have a team that is like our provisioning team. They're primarily responsible with procuring the servers from our vendor, um, inventorying that information into NetBox. So we kind of like divide and conquer here a little bit where one team is just exclusively responsible with inventory and NetBox, getting all the cables connected. But once we have all that information uh, within NetBox and the servers start to actually get plugged in, um, because we know what we wanted, which is like, for example, we know that server A, its very first ethernet port should be connected to switch one, its very first ethernet port. Because we have that knowledge in mind in terms of our intent, we're able to leverage the server's APIs like Redfish uh, is really good for this, where you can actually query the Redfish API and it will give you details about the remote uh, uh, link layer discovery protocol neighbor. So in our case, that'd be a switch, so we'd say, I'm server A, I believe I'm connected to switch one. And then switch, I'm, I believe I'm connected to switch one's port one. And if those two align, we're good to go. Um, and because of that API access that we have to the servers, we're able to take what's in NetBox and those APIs, tie them together and build up scripts so that when we have our SOC team do the installation, we run a script that says, do cable check. And the cable check will say, here are all the servers that are miscabled. You know, either it's plugged into the wrong port, not plugged in at all. And it gives them instructions as to what was wrong with their cabling. Because as you can imagine, if you go to roll out a fleet of 40 servers and there's let's say six fibers and two copper per server, it's very easy for these folks to make a mistake, especially when you know PCI cards are inverted in a certain direction where port one is left to right and then next time it's right to left. So that cable check capability was really critical for us to ensure that we have like the sound uh, infrastructure up front here. Uh, and then uh, based off of all that information that's in NetBox, we kind of are in a position where we can start to kind of get to the bootstrap of of our uh, of our servers themselves here. So maybe what I'll do, and I'll just drive this, Aaron, but I'll let you take it up cool. from here yeah. and then we'll go from there. Sure. Um, so like, like we've sort of touched on here, all of our provisioning is done through NetBox and Terraform. So um, in, in this case, sorry, it's been a while since I looked at this presentation. <laughs> um, so in this case, we, um, we've written some Terraform modules as well as providers to sort of help us with this um, for the infrastructure provisioning part. So we have a standard set of servers that allow us to mount like IPXC and virtual CDs and whatnot through HTTP REST calls. So we've leveraged that to sort of start our bootstrapping process, similar to what the OpenShift installer does, just a lot more targeted in our case. Um, at the end of the day, what this really lets us do is have a single source of truth uh, per region. So dev, QA, prod, et cetera. And within that state, we can easily, you know, expand or contract the cluster by adding and removing nodes into NetBox and, you know, Terraform instantly picks that up. And then we can choose to apply those changes or not, depending on what we are attempting to do. Um, so, for example, if we decide to remove a node from the cluster because it's unhealthy or whatever, we simply remove it from NetBox, do a Terraform apply and it will remove it from the cluster remove all permissions and remove all subsequent resources like nm states and everything along those lines from all of our subsequent repositories so essentially it just wipes it out of existence um so that's that's kind of like the basis of our our infrastructure provisioning right there is you know single source of truth and then just custom terraform modules and um yeah so no that's fine yeah go ahead <laughs> sorry um, so we are in a disconnected environment. Um, this is this is a little trickier when it comes to telco. While it is the standard, um, it, it's not it's not exactly easy to <laughs> easy to work in this environment. You know, there's we make use of a number of OpenShift operators, um, and some of them require 
you know, a disconnected mirror to our local registry, which is fine. But however, some of them make references to tags and that doesn't necessarily work properly in OpenShift. But I guess our, our design is we have two registries here. We have our um, external one, which is, you know, which allows vendors to push images and Helm charts to our um, uh, edge registry, let's call it. Um, from there, we actually mirror them over to another internal registry, which is what's connected to all of our um, clusters. Now, within the internal registry, obviously, that's where we do another subsequent level of scanning and security is sort of involved to, you know, note any vulnerabilities and stuff like that to ensure that images are okay to be pushed to our cluster. Um, so base install. Um, yeah, so we, we use Let's Encrypt for all of our secrets for API ingress. That's all once again managed through Terraform modules and CICD jobs to sort of keep everything in sync and automatically provision everything. Um, all of our secrets are stored in Vault, um, as well as any sensitive configuration that we require. Um, then, when I mentioned previously, our Terraform modules sort of build our Matchbox profiles based off of Netbox data. So that just goes back to sort of you know our, our deployment model. Um, we mount the iPixie over um, virtual CD-ROM generally with our nodes. Uh, we have gone down the path of TFTP boots. Uh, and whatnot and it's just it's a much cleaner method just using ipixie images that we custom build um once again our our custom ipixie boot script is based off of netbox data and it's generated anytime there's a change um so our controllers are vm based um so that allows us to have well multi-tenancy but also multi-cluster if we need to while maintaining like a single set of vms or a single set of physical hardware sorry um, and our one of the providers that we have written actually does our CSR, CSR approvals based off of Netbox data as well, just to you know take that manual effort out of the provisioning process. So it's, it really is a one-click install for us, and that's our base install for our cluster. Um, so yeah, so our GitOps approach um, since we. Like Jared mentioned, we wanted to be able to do a one-click install and have it install not only our cluster, but also deploy all of our GitOps configuration from day zero to um, a running tenant. So the way that we've sort of approached this is there's a, there's a, I don't know how to phrase this, sorry. There's, there's a combination of Terraform, which will actually reach out and do the initial apply for our GitOps approach, um, because we need to apply something to the cluster. So we have a Terraform provider that will go out and you know apply our initial bootstrap for the cluster. Um, once that's taken care of, then everything sort of flows based off of, well, previously sync waves now, like I talk about at some point here, we use Flux for all of this, which has um, a little bit more granular dependency mapping. So we can ensure that everything is installed in the proper order. And you know, at the end of the day, we install um, a bunch of operators like ESO. I just saw somebody ask a question. We do use ESO for our vault integration. Um, and then downstream, you know, our Dell power, like our storage array, all that kind of stuff gets installed. Then finally, we actually install our, our tenants. Um, OLM operator installation is a little, little difficult because we choose to use the manual method. I mean, obviously we're in a disconnected environment and we can, could technically set it to an automated installation. However, that just opens us up to the risk of somebody mirroring over, you know, newer images than what we're actually comfortable running and then something automatically, you know, approving and upgrading. And that's just not a risk that we want to take. So we use um, manual jobs to sort of install our OLMs during the GitOps bootstrap process and upgrade as well. Um, and then, sorry, um, we have failed artifact remediation because occasionally there is issues where, you know, uh, an operator won't install and you need to go in and actually remove like the config map from the marketplace namespace and everything like that. Um, so once again, fully disconnected. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the images that we use um, either well, from, from operators and some other installations require tags, which is not supported by image content source policy, uh, at least the time of this writing, I haven't looked recently, which means that we actually need to use machine config to roll out a number of those changes, which is um, slightly more painful, but it, it works and it gets the job done. So we have mirrors of, you know, um, Flux, we have mirrors of ESO, all that kind of stuff that we mirror to our local registry. Um, NM state is a big thing for us. 
Um, so when Jared was talking about our bootstrap process and you know how we use uh, Matchbox and everything like that, one thing to note is that we only ever configure it with bond zero. Um, absolutely everything else is configured through NM state. So all of our other VLANs, everything like that is configured from NM state and all of that is fully generated from NetBox based off of um, CICD jobs as well that simply make merge requests to the appropriate repos when needed. So that really sort of gets away from having to manually manage those NM state files. I'm not sure if anybody's used them, but they can get quite verbose when you're talking about, you know, 20 or 30 VLANs and what have you. So um, another big thing for us is our patch operator. Um, this, this has kind of been a lifesaver for a lot of this where, you know, we do need to make patches to existing objects within OpenShift that come default, such as, you know, disabling, uh, disabling the default um, marketplace resources and stuff like that. So we, we use that for, you know, sort of managing those as well as um, labeling all of our compute nodes appropriately based off of, once again, NetBox data. So we label them with things such as um, like their role, their rack, their position, all that kind of stuff. So that just really allows us to be granular with our node selectors if we need to. Um, so, yeah. Sorry, just grabbing some water. Um, so when we started this endeavor, we we went with Argo CD because it was an obvious solution. Um, you know, we're using OpenShift. Why not use OpenShift GitOps, which is essentially Argo CD. However, um, as we had more vendors come on board, we found out that a lot of them make use of hooks that are not available, like Helm hooks, sorry, that are not available in Argo CD. And there doesn't really seem to be a roadmap to sort of incorporate these. So right there, there was kind of a hard hard 360 for us to just go a completely different direction or hard 180, I should say. Um, so with that, we ended up going with Flux. Um, and that just allows us to have a much better Helm integration where we can use all the native Helm hooks, all the tests that vendors tend to run after their charts are installed. Um, yeah, so our, our design has changed and morphed sort of over time here, like I'm sure most people have. So our tenant bootstrap, like vendor expectations was always to have full cluster admin. And that seems to be the case with every single vendor that comes in. And that's consistently a pain point for us. Um, we've approached this a number of different ways, but at, at the end of the day, we end up having like a tenant admin repository, which installs things still through Flux and GitOps and Argo, whatever, it doesn't really matter for this use case. But um, the tenant admin will install like CRDs, you know, um, anything that requires elevated permission, validation, web hooks, all that kind of stuff. And that is locked down so that the vendors are able to see those repositories and make merge requests if they want, but they can obviously never um, action and approve any merges in there. Whereas our actual tenant repositories, um, I get into this a little bit later, I think, but we've broken it down so that it's, you know, one repository per namespace. And that just allows us to really sort of scope what the activity um, in that namespace is um, in terms of like callback hooks and, you know, permission sets and everything like that. Um, we, we've kind of worked out a uh, vendor workflow for the most part here where, um, you know, we scaffold everything and build it. Once again, it's all automated. So we've done it once and now it's just repeated. Um, and then we actually have the vendors come in and help us with that. So what I mean by that is they'll, they'll, they know their values and their applications better than I ever will or ever really want to. Um, so they'll help us with like the values files and make merge requests and stuff like that. And it, once again, everything is approved by SASTEL. And um, we've actually done a whole bunch of validation behind the scenes where um, anytime a merge request is made, for example, we run a whole bunch of jobs that will actually template out and then scan all of the rendered um, YAML from Helm. And it'll identify what a Helm chart's actually trying to install, um, whether it's like CRDs, um, config maps, doesn't really matter. It, it will also identify anything that's an admin resource and sort of flag that in the notes for the merge request saying like this chart's now trying to install a validating webhook and this is its targets and here's the data type of thing. Just to make it easier for the people that are doing the uh, merge request approvals to sort of understand what they are, what, what the vendor is hoping to accomplish with, you know, change the values. You can go ahead there, Jaren. Um, so a repository design. So 
we started out initially with just one massive repository for a vendor. I'm just going to focus on the tenant here. Um, and that that was OK. Um, but once we sort of you know moved to Flux, we realized that you know that that doesn't really work as well as we'd like anymore because we've leveraged a whole bunch of callbacks from Flux where you know whether it's an OCI image now or um, a changing Git, what will actually end up happening is you know there'll be an instant callback to a hook that's created in the cluster to say hey come and reconcile me. So there you don't have to wait for that sync interval anymore. So because of that. Um, we made the decision to sort of just scope it down. So it's like one namespace, one hook. And then, you know, any obviously there could be a number of charts in that namespace, but it's still just that one targeted namespace. Um, so we, we do allow for cross namespace dependency mapping. Um, so quite often we'll see a vendor come in and they'll have 30 namespaces or 15 namespaces. Um, they might require a subset of applications to be deployed in namespace one before anything can be deployed in namespace two. It might not be all of them, might be just a subset or it could be everything. So really um, with Flux, we're able to just sort of do that dependency map and to say, hey, don't bother installing anything in NS2 until these six Helm charts in NS1 are deployed. Um, so another big part is obviously our secrets and our ACLs and everything like that. So with our Vault integration, each namespace has its own sort of app role um that's generated automatically through terraform and stored in vault in a predefined path based off of tenant and all that kind of jazz so that allows us to just sort of have a repeatable pattern for every single vendor that comes in um now the biggest benefits is like the smaller git history because you know we're not making changes to 30 repository or 30 repos every single day we might only make a change to one value in one repository so it just consolidates our git history footprint um, the reconciliation is significantly faster with this method. Um, but like I say here, the downside is the repo sprawl. And it is not great, admittedly, but it is the best option that I think we've sort of come up with. Um, we've also, since this has been done, we've also started moving to more OCI images for our actual deployment as well. Um, so instead of you know running customize, build, all that kind of stuff, we actually just serve all that up in an OCI image as well. So. Uh, I think I touched on some of this. The vendors can pr uh, propose changes, but they can't approve it. Um, we do a whole bunch of internal audits. Um, and, and really, the benefit here is that it keeps the vendor engaged with us as long as they're you know, part of the project. Um, once again, it's their product. They should be the experts in that. I, I just um, wanted to add to oh, that, though, Aaron, because I think it's yeah. just relevant here is that I think one of the things that we found with our relationships with our vendors here is that um, our vendor is their core competencies tended to be on the function itself. Like, you know, whatever it is that they're selling us, that's what they're really good at. The cloud part of it seems to be a weak area for them. Um, and I think what we've found with our interactions with our vendors over time, and especially establishing these types of workflows where they can participate with us on these merge requests, is that they're learning from us and we're building the relationship more strongly with them. And what that sort of the, the byproduct of that is that with each subsequent sort of release cycle that they have on their software, it's starting to adhere more closely aligned to cloud native principles. And it's kind of neat to sort of see a vendor that comes in and, and where historically I used to say, you know, I, back in the day when a vendor would come and they would sit with you to work through something, you would learn a bunch from them. You'd be like, I'm, I'm ignorant about some technology. This person's an expert. They've been deploying this function all across the world. And you'd learn something. These days, that's kind of going by the wayside. Like, they're still experts on the function, but all the cloud components, they tend to be learning from the customer in most cases here. And so uh, I just think it, it's been it's been good because we've actually pushed back on a lot of vendors with respect to multi-tenancy, where you know they would come in and say, we expect full root access to the cluster. And we would just say, nope. And they weren't used to hearing that. And what would ultimately happen is there'd be some project managers wondering, you know, why can't we move this project forward? And we were very steadfast in our belief that we wanted this to be, um, you know, following the principles that we felt were important to actually have a, a cloud native architecture. And I think that that has worked because we've had lots of back and forth with R and D teams. Um, they've continually made the products better. And I, I think that that's sort of just a takeaway I have from this is that. Um, we, we can't just be pushovers when when a vendor just says we're just we just give me root access i'll just we'll just make it work we'll just make it work you can certainly take that approach but 
I think that it's worth the effort of fighting those fights because it's just going to make for a better overall um, solution at the end here. Yeah, and I know just to sort of piggyback off that, one of the biggest issues that we face with the whole GitOps approach is the fact that whether you use Argo, Flux, or any other GitOps mechanism, they all require the ability to essentially render out the templates from you know Helm charts. Unfortunately, a lot of vendors um, ship us Helm charts that uh, produce invalid YAML. So, you know, duplicate keys, you know, incorrect values, all that kind of stuff. And they just, they expect Helm to just sort of handle that and it's abstract or they don't really care to fix it. So they, you know, specify, let's say, um, maybe they name a port UDP when it's actually TCP because they haven't specified a type or, you know, name is defined twice in the stanza. Now Helm doesn't really care. However, all GitOps systems, whether it's Argo or Flux, do actually care about that. So a number of times we've actually had to push back on multiple vendors to go and fix their Helm charts. Now, that's not always the easiest conversation to have, and it's usually adds a delay. Um, but we have been successful in getting a lot of these vendors to actually go back and change their processes so that they are ensuring that what they ship out is valid for sort of a GitOps approach. I'll just take this one, Aaron. Yeah, and you can yeah. No, so I just want to kind of comment. So like one of the things that we we had actually introduced to here, which was kind of a strange products uh, choice here, was Apache Airflow. So what I was hoping to achieve with like, you know, run out the infrastructure. And then once we got um, the actual OpenShift installed was like, how do we validate that our infrastructure is sound and it, it does what it needs to do and it fails over as expected. And so what we basically we're hoping to achieve is we wanted an ability to say, I want to schedule work on the cluster and I want it to be scheduled in such a way that it kind of is coordinated with in interactions with the network layer. And so when I was looking at solutions for this, um, I kept seeing Apache Airflow, but what was strange about it was that Apache Airflow is, tends to be in like the data science space. And a lot of people who are doing like, you know, ETL transformations of data and then moving it to another system, you see Apache Airflow show up all the time, but you by and large, don't see it show up with respect to things to do with, say, OpenShift or our network automation. But it actually kind of was really cool in the way that it was able to allow us to, to do some testing here. And, and I'm, what I'm trying to sort of illustrate here is that essentially the same data that we have in Netbox, which is this theme that keeps reemerging here, is also used to drive a lot of the automation of the Apache Airflow. So what would happen in a case like this is, you know, we spin up, we do Terraform apply, we've got a cluster alive, we've got all of our OpenShift installed. What we would then do is Apache Airflow will schedule um, a pod onto every worker node that we have in our cluster. And every worker node has a corresponding set of physical interfaces on that compute node, which connects to you know diverse leaf switches. So for example, an odd leaf is on port one and an even leaf is on port two. Well, what happens if we lose leaf one, for instance? Like, does the traffic still continue to work? Is our cluster still healthy? Um, what happens for our storage layer? Like what if um, in our case, we use external storage for block and file storage? Like is the storage layer meeting the requirements for our workloads for the IOPS and things like that. And so what was kind of interesting about Airflow here is we were able to sort of tie these together in like a dependent fashion. So an example would be, I want you to test worker one. And what it would do is Airflow is able to run little sort of miniature jobs and, you know, up front, maybe it checks the fabric health and says, okay, this server is up. It's got both links on the leaf switches online. Your bond is good to go. And then we started like an iperf test to a remote um, target uh, device under test so that we have sort of a stream of bits that are that are going through the network. And then what we do is as we as we reach that threshold, we then intentionally go and we break the connectivity on the IP fabric layer. So we'll break connectivity to that server on the first port. And then what we'll do, this is where you can see it says, you know, annotate Grafana, disable the leaf link. And then what it does is it sort of has a threshold to say, okay, you were sending through 100 megabits or a gigabit per second before I disabled that link. Now I've um, disabled the link, and so you only have one remaining link left. Are we still achieving that rate of the, what you set forward here, which is, say, a gigabit? If it is, we roll back that change we just made to the IP fabric. So now we've got both links back in, in service again, and then we break the other link. So these the, the, the odd, uh, pardon me, the even leafs interface. And we kind of do that throughout. And we were able to do this to set, sort of test both the compute nodes failover capability with our uh, network. And we're also able to leverage it. And it's not illustrated here, but same thing with we schedule pods that have got like uh, do FIO tests, right? So we schedule pod, it's got a, we use the a CSI operator to dynamically provision that storage. And we've got a volume that's like a file volume for NFS and a block volume. And we just use FIO and we write 
um, like basically benchmark tests against those uh, volume mounts. And then we report that data back up to our uh, time series database to record that. So essentially you, what you can do is uh, you pick your cluster and you say, run the sort of uh, day one burn test. And then what it'll do is it runs through all these series of tests, testing both the compute nodes um, for CPU, the network layer, and the storage subsystem all in kind of one go. And at the end of it, you get this great big like matrix of all these green boxes for every one of your nodes to tell you, yeah, it passed or it failed. And so it's just a way for us to automate that testing approach here. I just want to quickly piggyback on that too. Yeah, when we first started this, our intent was always to look at doing chaos engineering from within the cluster as well. Um, unfortunately, a lot of CNF vendors do not like that idea. Um, it's still something that we are hoping to sort of push forward here because we really should be able to run chaos tests at every single layer and have still have a fully functional cluster. So it kind of plays into the whole failover and the health of the application as well, which um, is something important for us. Uh, just because, like Jared said, we make the paper if something fails. Um, yeah, I guess I can kind of touch on this here. So. <laughs> We see a reoccurring pattern with every single vendor that sort of come in. Um, once again, no documentation, no change logs, deprecated APIs, um, a, a big push for professional services, uh, which is kind of funny. Um, elevated permissions, that's once again, security, a big one. We just over and over again, they, it's just something that always happens. Um, the manual inf intervention of always just wanting to quickly edit something to make it work, to hit timelines is kind of, um, also a reoccurring theme here. Um, and then untested packages. Uh, more often than not, we've actually gone through and in, you know done an installation of an application only to find out that the Helm chart doesn't work right. It's missing SCC rules. It's missing um, RBAC permissions. It, it it's just it's not an actual healthy deployment yet. It's shipped as a final GA product, um, which is <laughs> a whole nother issue of this space here. But it's just. The open source community is significantly better in terms of what you see for like Helm charts for, you know, um, any sort of CRDs, deployments, operators, whatever, than what we're actually seeing from vendors at this point in time. So, yeah, we, once again, um, Jared mentioned that they're not always experts in cloud, and that's sort of something that we keep seeing and running into over and over again. Um, so we, we we try to work with every single vendor that we have um, because we want to make it better not only for ourselves but for anybody else that's in this um, position. Um, the big push from us is for incremental patch releases. I mean, we're talking about containers and Helm charts here, but a lot of these vendors are still stuck in the you know, six month release cycles of their application. So even if there is a glaring issue in whether it's their core functionality or their Helm charts, we find that we're waiting months for them to actually patch something that is a 10 second change. It's, it's something that I think the industry as a whole sort of needs to change a little bit when we start talking about um, Helm charts and containers. Um, yeah, once again, dev and test regions are invaluable for us. Uh, <laughs> that's, Jared mentioned the whole canary release. Um, it, it's not something that we can do, but that's a limitation of the vendor's applications. They just can't actually seem to handle the whole canary concept right now. Um, we've we've done a lot of init containers and monkey patching um, just to sort of get around some of this as well, some of the issues that we've found. Um, Git sync sidecar has been a big, big help for us as well. Um, we, we found that a lot of vendors will go in and uh, They'll use NFS as a backend storage or for file storage. Um, th they might have six replicas running and their solution for you know configurations to go in and VI a file and just expect it to be there for all the containers instead of using something like a config map for no for no reason. They're not like large files or just that's just how they've done it. So really what it kind of looks like is a lot of vendors have just sort of shoehorned a legacy application into a container and called it cloud native and walked away. Um, Post renders, um, they have <laughs> saved us a lot from ba bad Helm charts. And that's, yeah, like Helm post render hooks, um, as well as customizers, just really helped us a lot in this. Yeah. And so that was that was the original slide deck that yeah. we presented at Commons. So I guess if there's time, we're happy to take any questions. Yeah. Sorry, it was a little rough. We haven't uh, gone through this in a while. So, well, Jared, I wasn't. 
that was amazing because uh, in Boston, you only had 20 minutes. So you, I love, thank you so much. You went into so much more detail and we do have a bunch of questions. So hopefully we can fit some in. Um, first, uh, Benjamin's asking how much ORAN do you do? ORAN, did you say? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah, that's sort of um, not not a lot right now. Um, and that was something that we kept finding as a, as a pattern as well. There's a lot of stuff around RAN on, in cloud, not enough around core network uh, CNF. So uh, myself, at least Aaron and myself, are not uh, primarily dealing with any of the ORAN stuff, although we do have some um, radio, uh, 5G radio stuff that's sort of you know trending in that direction. Nice, thanks. Um, Dan, you have a number of questions. Do you want to prioritize which you would like to ask first? If not, that's okay. I'm going to go work backwards. Um, would you say NetBox almost acts as your JIRA or ITSM? Um, no, uh, I wouldn't. Uh, NetBox is, is really just a, it's a, uh, a data modeling uh, place. So basically the idea here is that you don't want, NetBox isn't going to reach out to your elements and like scan them like an NMS or something and like in, in, in automatically import them. NetBox is supposed to be like you manually go to NetBox and you describe the model of your network that you want it to have and then use other automation techniques to ensure that it adheres to what your data model in NetBox looks like. So um, that's very, it, it's very important that, um, you only put it one place, and that's the way they always say the source of truth. But yeah, no, it's not one of those types of systems that doesn't handle our ticketing or anything like that. Thank you. Um, let's see. Will the change in the Terraform licensing model have an impact financially or otherwise? Um, I, obviously, with the new license it's it's hard to say but it shouldn't um everything that we've built has obviously been built on an older version uh this was a recent change by terraform and obviously open tofu is something that's coming in and if we can we'll look at migrating um but right now we're just pinning to a, essentially a the current version or the previous version to the license change and we won't see any sort of impact uh, let's see what challenges have you seen around ipv6 and do you expect that this VNF will have a shorter deployment, will have shorter deployment times and adoption with 6G. Do you mean 5G or 6G? Since it's just a change in the transmission frequency. Yeah, so I, I think, so the V6 thing, um, that's still, you know, unfortunately, like most telcos are really not um, all the way along on that front still. I think for V6 for us, we would still ultimately probably see that more at the CNF uh, V6 addressing less so on the cluster level so all of our cluster open shift is v4 the workloads themselves for v6 for us would primarily be things like uh you know ip pools that are handed out to ues or this is your smartphone uh language um in terms of like you know 6g which is you know the you know sort of the uh the post 5g um yeah it's just really kind of more of the same decoupling of these functions i don't think that uh v6 is going to be uh, a problem for us in the general terms of what we deployed here it's really more to do with our transport uh, networks out to our remote ran sites and our core point-to-point -point links that uh, allow that communication to happen but i don't see any sort of like um, blockers with respect to open shift or our automation approach here Thanks. And, it, and it's fully modeled in netbox as well you can do v6 in there without issue do the vendors, all right, so here's one from William. Do the vendors update their repos accordingly? So I keep their Helm charts up to date and public. I think you touched on this already, but. Yeah, um, so they're, they're generally not public. Um, they have you know, proprietary, let's call it deployments. Um, <laughs> really, it's just wrapping a whole bunch of community charts and then their application a lot of the times. But no, they, they will keep them up to date. And that's sort of where we see them push them to our external registry which uh they depending on the vendor they might have vpn access into and then we mirrored over to our internal both helm and um images and whatnot but they they are keeping them up to date for our sort of use case and that's where our sort of helm scanning comes into play so if they decide to bump a chart version um and we automatically kick off a scan and it suddenly fails because of helm template or permissions or whatever obviously we will be notified right in that merge request about what's going on and then we can take appropriate action and deny that merge. 
Thanks. Um, and here's a great one from Lisa too. Um, what would help in terms of standardizing CNF packaging? So, I mean, I know there's a push for Nephio right now, which is, uh, well, like, obviously Red Hat's involved in that. Um, However, I know there's some vendors that aren't on board with that because they're so far down the the helm path at this point in time. Um, but really, I, I think OCI images are going to be the way to go. Um, not just from um, a, sort of a packaging up your application and you know overwriting it with whatever custom IPs you need to add in, but also just from a distribution of um, the actual deployment. So Git is obviously not the best mechanism to constantly pull every minute. Um, as opposed to, you know, Harbor or um, any other registry, which you can just pull an OCI image from that happens to have all your deployments from. So I, ideally, it would be something like Nephew, um, from what I know of it anyway. Uh, but I think Nephew as well makes use of the OCI. So I think it really just comes down to OCI in this case. Um, and with one minute to go, um, Going through all these questions really fast, it's awesome. Um, how big of a footprint is this? Or your? Yeah, so footprint, we have um, a dev, two QA, two production regions today. Um, I think footprint wise, the compute count, I guess uh, each region sort of varies here, but um, like over 100 uh, compute nodes. But I think that's sort of the way we've designed it. It's really not a scaling limit. Uh, in terms of uh, our automation, it's really just, you know, how much more rack space and, and cooling can we fit into the data centers here? But that'll be primarily driven by our CNF onboarding. So our team receives requests that says, we need this new function. We have a planning exercise that determines we need, you know, whatever, 10 more compute nodes. We buy them, we insert them, and we add them to the cluster, and we just hors horizontally scale from there. Nice. Uh, David, did that answer your question? I didn't. I was just trying to figure out. Um, the um, question from a working standpoint is: uh, I mean, if I have to you know, be disconnected from like the cloud environment, et cetera, on-prem um, types of environment, for, like emergency management or incident management, how big of a footprint are we talking about? Are we talking about um, like a router truck, you know, type of thing? Or can it be smaller, bigger, et cetera, or a semi? That makes sense. Um, you're kind of muffled. Um, we'll see if yeah, can you the, into the chat. And we'll take Dan's really fast, and then we'll come back to that one. Yeah. So I just want to clarify. When you said file, I was actually thinking file the block storage testing tool. But then I thought maybe you're using that as the file integrity operator. What? Which one was it when you referred to file? The first one that you mentioned. Got it. Perfect. Thanks. Can you put that one into, because there's a lot of FIOs. I think I got confused on that one too. Can you put that one into chat? We can capture that one in the notes. Okay. File integrity. All right. Are there any more? We're one minute over. Are there any more questions, last minute thoughts? Um, okay, thanks, David. I'll put that one into how physical of a footprint are you using? And if I were to go on prem, prem how big would I need to use? I think that probably yeah. the largest. Okay, I'll try to I'll try to tackle that one. So I, there really is not really a restriction on the, the smallest to the largest. So we built it such that our minimum footprint would be like uh, well three controllers. So you could physically have like say one compute node with three VMs which obviously you wouldn't want to do that for resilience sake, but you could go one hypervi hypervisor node that runs your control plane and one worker node um, that could run your workload. So it can be as small as that. We've even actually, when we, before we, had, uh, as, as a lot of you are aware, we had that whole supply chain problem over the last couple of years. So we couldn't get servers. So all of this was actually done initially in virtual machines. So we, the same exact uh, methodology was applied to just say, I've got this one really beefy server and I would spin up a bunch of VMs to prove out the workflow. Um, and so it scales from, you know, two servers to as big as you can, you know, fill in your data center, right? So um, again, it's uh, our footprint right now. Usually, a pod for us is three three racks uh, at forty four 
URAC. So, uh, but for our standard deployment, I would say we always have three physicals for our control plane. And then after that, it's just however many workers we need to fulfill the workload requirements. Thank you. All right, since we are three over, um, I'll send the notes to you. And thank you so much, Aaron, Jared, for being with us and going through that again. That was so much more in depth and it was really valuable. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna stop recording and see you all next time. Thank you.